Chapman Center. Folks, my next guest, what an enjoyable read. It was incredible for me to read this. Because just like the author and many people, I, um, I was such a fan when uh, David Letterman, I remember watching his daytime program. I thought it was brilliant. I'd never seen anyone with that type of sense of humor. Daytime didn't work for him. But then the late show, when he was on at 12.30 after Johnny Carson, of course, that's when uh, so many people, it really became, it was, um, it was just incredible to watch. And the late, it was, it was much watched you know, CTV before that even existed. But I first became uh, such a fan of his during the course of when I first discovered him, when he had that brief period of time that he was on during the daytime. And my next guest decided, you know, he he worked on the program and he writes, I'm going to write, I caught the day bug in the summer of 87 between junior, senior of high school. He used to stay up and watch Carson with his father, but then he always... Uh, he always turned the TV off, said goodnight before Letterman came on. And then he suddenly became a huge fan of The Late Show with, with David Letterman. And joining us right now, and it is uh, such a great read, The Last Days of Letterman, the final six weeks, I want to welcome to the program, and it's Scott Ryan. Scott, it's John DePietro. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for that setup. You're better than Ed McMahon, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> You're very kind. You know, I um, again, it was incredible reading this, and... Um, what, what I really liked was how you set up in your book, and I obviously won't give it all away, but when you set up the fact that immediately after David Letterman announced that the show was going to come to an end, and as the first guest came out, it suddenly became that the sentiment was going to be that the guests were really acting on behalf of us to thank Letterman for all those years for everything he did and just being this iconic incredible television personality that changed television and that the tone was really going to turn into a tribute to him for the remaining you know uh, portion of time he was going to be on the air yeah and, and dave really did not want that to happen at all in fact he was instructing the staff you know don't let this happen but when they got in the chair you know, there's, he couldn't stop it. And Sarah Jessica Parker really was the one who just said, you're going to sit there and take it like a man. And she poured her heart out today. And, you know, he, he can't stand that kind of feeling. But as viewers, we were living through those celebrities and guests who were saying exactly how we felt. And talk a little bit about the influence, uh, Scott, if you will, that he had on you and, and how it, you know, all started for you. I love how you set up, and it's so relatable of, you know, you used to stay up with your dad and uh, and watch Carson. Yeah, I mean, when I was younger, and before I could even really get the joke, it was about sitting with my dad and watching something that made him laugh. And, I, I mean, I loved Johnny, of course, but he didn't speak to me. But in the summer, between my junior and senior year of high school, I started to stay up late, and I watched Late Night with David Letterman on NBC, and Dave was telling the kind of jokes that I got. You know, I could get the references, and the way he was with guests was, you know, Johnny was so smooth and polished, and Letterman just really wasn't. I mean, Letterman said what, what a punk... Uh, college kid wanted to hear and it just it changed the way I talked it changed the music I listened to the way I told the story and I always said Dave was was my TV friend and I watched him every day all the way till 2015 when it ended and you know big portion of my day was taken away with that you know, you're exactly right. And, and for instance, I do want to get into the book, and folks, we're speaking with Scott Ryan, but are you, Scott, like me, as, as much as, and it's nothing against, you know, the, the late night host now, whether it be Colbert or Fallon or Kimmel or, or Conan, but I don't know. I, I just, I haven't, I don't tape any of them. I used to tape Letterman and watch it, and sometimes you almost appreciate it a little bit more because you're not tired or thinking, like, i got to go to sleep or anything like that. But have you found that same type of feeling um, and, and get the same satisfaction from watching it at the, the late, current late-night hosts? 
No, and it's nothing against any of them. It's that Dave brought something that was different. And it, it mostly happens in the interviews. You know, there can be some comedy pieces that are good. I really, Seth Meyers does some good comedy. But the sitting across from a celebrity and not knowing what Dave was going to say, that is what I loved. And also, it was the side thing. You know, one of my favorite things ever was a night when Dave wanted to hear an Eagle song. And he just said to Paul, play an Eagle song. And all of a sudden, everyone in the control booth is freaking out because it'll cost them millions of dollars to play a song by the Eagles. Well, that became the whole show. Dave trying to push them to play it. And that just doesn't happen in late night anymore because it's all scripted. Scott, you had incredible access to the people uh, behind the scenes. How did you come up with the concept, and I know you write that when you first approached the idea of the final six weeks of Letterman, that all the people that you spoke with, that they all thought it was kind of nuts, but then in the end, their perspective makes for, I think, uh, especially Barbara Gaines, and, um, well, so many of them, but it, it makes for a great read. Yeah, recently I talked to Bill Carter, who wrote really the first book about Late Night Way yes. Back in the battle for the Tonight Show. And he told me, when I heard about your book, I thought, what a horrible idea. <laughs> I'm so used to everyone saying that. But to me, it was, the, it was the way to look really closely at what they did on that show. So it's a really deep dive into 28 specific episodes. And therefore, you really get the daily routine of it. And at first, I didn't know... I mean, because I was just a viewer and a fan, I didn't know how many people had to come together to pull off what they did, and their stories are fascinating. So in the beginning of the book, you might think, oh, I, I can't wait to hear what Dave and Paul have to say. Well, they're not. I, I never interviewed them. You're going to be more fascinated in the segment producers and the stage managers and all of the things that they had to do to get these wishes that Dave wanted to come to fruition. Barbara Gaines is a really interesting character in the book. She was executive producer. Um, what, what was it like? And just talk a little bit about Barbara Gaines and her contribution to the book, which is the last six weeks of Letterman. Well, Barbara Gaines is the heart and soul of the book and the show, really. Uh, anyone who watched Dave with the regularity, especially in the beginning times, knows Barbara Gaines. She was on screen quite a bit. And she was the first person that I went after, and I basically internet stalked her for about a year and a half, just kept tweeting to her saying, can I interview you? And none of them really wanted to talk because... I think at that point they didn't know that my intentions were pure, that it was only going to be about the work that we were going to talk about. And Barbara, she, once she agreed to speak with me, that opened the floodgates to everyone because I think they knew, oh, if Barbara Gaines talked to you, then that sort of gets the blessing. And that's when you get the really behind-the-scenes look at what happened on these shows. Again, folks, good afternoon. It's John DePietro. We're speaking with Scott Ryan, his new book, The Last Days of Letterman, The Final Six Weeks. Um, before we talk about some of the, and, and Scott literally takes you through the last six weeks, and I saw so many of them, but you get the behind the scenes from the people that worked on the show with David Letterman. I do want to talk about Chapter 8, Johnny Strikes Up the Band, Carson and Letterman. You know, it, it all comes back. To Carson, he influenced so many people. He moved the co the show to the West Coast. He he set up how you know the show should should be. I I don't you know I know it had been Steve Allen and the Jack Parr, but it was Carson that pushed it over. And you you can't even it's hard to measure up the respect that Letterman had for Carson. In in Letterman's mind, to me, it was Dave Letterman. It was it was always about. Carson, and I think Carson, Scott, he seemed to recognize that because in, in Bill Carter, his book, Late Shift, which reads like fiction, that then takes you back behind the scenes when, <laughs> yeah. you know, Leno was um, uh, his manager, 
was uh, Helen was, you know, floating rumors out there, and the New York Post had that they wanted him, and then he was going to go to CBS, and that forced, you know, Carson to decide to step down and want to go out that way. And even he, he told Leno, you know, it's someone coming from your camp. But I, a great part of the Bill Carter show, uh, book, excuse me, is it's the upfront week in New York, and Carson's on stage at... Radio City Music Hall, and all the affiliates are there, and all the advertisers, and Carson just calmly walks out on stage and says, well, as you know, this year will be my final year, and all the NBC executives in the front start to turn back to and start talking to each other, like, does anyone know about this? What is he talking about? Carson walks off stage, gets in a car, boom, and he's headed right to the Letterman show where he went. But I like that. Um, how much did you find, were they looking back on, you know, how did Carson go out and let him just, I, I don't want to say obsessed, but it, he felt Carson did the show the right way, had the utmost respect for him. It all came down in Letterman's mind to Johnny Carson. Yeah, and one of the things that Bill Sheff, who wrote the monologue with Dave every night for 20, 25 years, one of the things he said to me that I never really considered before was that Dave is the only talk show host up till now who got to leave on his own terms. Because just as you said, you know, even Johnny Carson, who is, of course, hands down the best talk show host ever, yep. he was basically pushed out by he was. and NBC. Yes. You know, even Johnny didn't get to step out. Now, the nice thing is, is that Leno gets his own when NBC basically does the same thing to him. But Dave got to go on his own terms. I mean, he announced his retirement, he picked the last day, and he left because he thought it was time to go. And so I think that's one way that Dave got to outshine Johnny, or at least had a different end to his story. But yes, Jerry Foley, the director, says in the book that whenever they came up to anything that they weren't sure what to do, the question was, what would Johnny do? Yeah. What did Johnny, you know, what would he have done in this situation? So Johnny was always the standard there for days. Scott, had you come up with any type of working theory and talking with the different people that what was it that made Letterman decide to leave? When he when he did leave, he joked and said, I think they're relieved at CBS. And then recently he did an interview, David Letterman did an interview, saying, oh, I should have left 10 years before I left. Now that I look back, he's talked about his career, but it was I think it was on Stern that Stern got the sense, Howard Stern got the sense that when Leno left, uh, Letterman thought, now I can be the dominant number one. But when Jimmy Fallon came in, and then he's doing all these bits that they're doing on YouTube, and they're doing all these different social media type stuff, and then he got the sense, or that Letterman said, all oh, the hell with this. Like, this is crazy. I, if, if I'm going to lose to Fallon, then maybe it's time to just kind of kind of hang it up with, you know, they were directing everything for Jimmy Fallon was becoming all these small, short, YouTube bits that have been being put out. Well, and you know, this is not something that I uncovered from, this is only me saying this, but two weeks before Dave announced his retirement, they did a bit about him having to tweet. And he was supposed to send out a tweet, and of course the bit was funny because Dave was acting like he didn't know how Twitter worked, and there was a lot of things. But when I was watching it, I thought, boy, Dave is uncomfortable and he doesn't want to do this. And I think it was because they were trying to, to move Dave to be a social media person. And he just never was going to be. And I do think that played a part. Now, he does say on the show that the reason he retired, he tells a really great story about how he had spent the whole day at work trying to figure out what bird him and Harry saw when they were fishing. And when he comes home, he's telling his wife, we figured out what bird it is, it's this. And then she says, oh, who was the guest on the show tonight? And Dave says, I don't remember. <laughs> and he decided, if, if I don't remember that yeah. and I'm interested in fishing, then I shouldn't be having a network show. Yeah. So whatever reason it was that tipped Dave, you know, whether it was the social media aspect of the way late night has become. But that goes back to my earlier thing, that one of my favorite things about the, you know, when Dave wanted to hear the Eagle song, you couldn't put that in a YouTube clip. Right. Because 
he did it the whole hour. And that was the point. When he comes back from commercial, he's going to lean over to the producers and say, can we play Hotel California or not? And, you know, it's the whole hour. It's not two seconds of comedy. Sure. And you know what now, and again, folks, good afternoon. It's Sean DePietro speaking with Scott Ryan, his new book, The Last Days of Letterman, The Final Six Weeks. You know, it's just, and we'll move on now into the book a little bit, Scott, but uh, to me now, I mean, think what nonsense it is, how they were putting pressure on Letterman, you know, you need to adapt to social media, blah, blah, blah. I mean, as we both know, it's all about content. And with all the junk out there, to think like that people were feeling, wow, you know, Jimmy Fallon, he's really ahead of Letterman because he's doing the YouTube stuff. I'm not saying that stuff's not important, but it, it still comes back to the original content. You have someone that is producing the original content, and so much of, of what Letterman was doing, from the top ten list to some of the bits, I mean, that was almost like built for social media. As you, if you don't have the right content, it doesn't matter if you have the social media platform. They had the original brilliant content Maybe it just needed to adapt to it, but I, I, I now it just seems so crazy. But let's get back into, um, I like how you illustrate how when Adam Sandler said he wanted to do the song for Letterman, you know, it, it sounded like the staff, they were always kind of weighing where the, was the guest going to go. And then Adam Sandler, who was a great Letterman guest, much like the way Stern was. And I don't think either one of them would have been, well, Sir Stern was never on with Carson, but they, that's where they were the best was on with Letterman. Letterman had certain guests that were just great with him, like Bill Murray, Howard Stern, or uh, an Adam Sandler. But the Sandler song set the tone just how much the celebrities themselves loved being on with Letterman. Oh, yeah. And, you know, quite a few people went on to sing a comedy song to Dave during those final six weeks. You had Nathan Lane, Martin Short, Billy Crystal, all comedy giants. But Adam Sandler has an element that no one else had, and that was a true sadness for leaving, that Dave was leaving television. And so Adam's song is funny, but it's heartfelt. But it's also not that Midler sitting on your desk singing um, One for the Road or You Made Me Love You. You know, that is not a Letterman fit at all. Dave doesn't want anyone sitting on his desk singing to him. But if you stand center stage and you sing a comedy song that also has some heart in it, that's a perfect Letterman bit. And I, I think no one did it better than Adam Sandler. Yeah. Do you think um, in going through uh, the book, the, the last six weeks and everything. Did, did you get the sense of the book from the people that at that point they were ready that they, what, what was their feeling? Were they glad that he was going out on his terms, as you said, or was, I mean, I'm sure to them, as much as they knew it was going to come to an end, it was just such a dream type of show to be part of. Um, that I, I think, I don't know, I, I got the sense it was like mixed emotion. They were happy for Letterman. They were obviously so grateful to have been part of the experience. But it is, it's, it's like a party that you never wanted to end. Yeah, and here's where I put on my highfalutin author hat. Um, I actually think that this book, while yes, it is about the end of The Late Show with David Letterman, the sub-story of this book is about someone losing their job. And I feel like we can all relate to that, especially now when there's so much downsizing going on. I mean, these were people who had worked for basically a mom and pop company, which is Worldwide Pants. They didn't work for CBS, they worked for Worldwide Pants. And they were all losing their job. And some of them had been there 15, 20, 30, 35 years. Now, if you worked there 35 years, you might be able to retire. But they had this wonderful job. A lot of the writers who had been there like 10 years, they said, now they got to go, you know, maybe write those bits for Fallon or Colbert that's shorter and a different sensibility. So while they were happy for Dave, I think all of them were worried about feeding their families and getting another job. And so that sadness was on top of them, along with an icon leaving television. I'm curious, uh, Scott, before we let you go, what do you think of, as someone that's obviously been a lifelong Letterman fan, what, what, do, you, what do you think of his, uh, his new, pro, new, new program 
my next guest on Netflix. So I absolutely love it, and I think this is where Dave shines. I think Dave is, if not the best interviewer out there, certainly one of them. I mean, you're up there, too. It's probably like Dave and then you. I don't think but so, I but think I'm surprised to hear you say that, because to me, I wanted to like it, but he goes back so far and it gets so deep, and I, I find, I don't know. I mean, he does have the crowd, and it is all him, and I don't know whether it's the White Sox or the beard, but, and, and maybe it's not fear because he's, he's out of the element, and I'm so used to it, and I loved seeing him in the setting of, of you know, the late night show that, um, that, may, maybe, that maybe that's part of it, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I, 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 I found myself not even watching the full interview of it, but you, you actually really enjoy it. You like it. Yeah, I mean, I think it does matter who the guest is. Um, there was one guest that I really didn't think ever got simpatico with Dave, but like, have you, you should watch the Jerry Seinfeld one, and you'll see, you really see two people having an extended conversation, and okay. it goes away again from the YouTube type of conversation, so it depends who the guest is, but I, I think it's a good fit for him at this point. Okay. Finally, I just want to ask you about a couple of the people that you did talk to, just starting with uh, Barbara Gaines, who was the um, executive producer. That that was a huge get on your part. Um, as you even said, that's when everything really started to fall into line. I mean, she, she if anyone had a front row seat for everything, it was Barbara Gaines. Yeah, and, and she is, she doesn't know that she had a front row seat in history. I mean, that's really what I learned. You know, when I kept she kept saying, why do you want to talk to me? You should talk to this person. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I need your story, too. And when she tells the story, which I won't give away, of her editing that final episode and getting it to CBS and all that they had to go through, it's crazy. And I'm the one breaking that story. Like, that's a story that should be in every entertainment uh newspaper everywhere because it's it's so fascinating what happened to them on the last day folks again it is a great read the last days of letterman the final six weeks by scott ryan scott again i really enjoyed it congratulations on the book and we'll talk to you again oh thank you so much all right folks there it is scott ryan again uh, if you are a Letterman fan, it is a great read. It takes you through the last thing, and especially the people uh, behind the scenes that were a big part of it. Folks, good afternoon. It's John DePietro. It is the John DePietro.